This is the testicular cancer walkthrough. I am Kent, your guide. I have either been cured of testicular cancer or it's in remission. Either way, I did a whole lot of research and I wanted to put it all together in one video meshed with my experience and some other information such as prices if you happen to be uninsured. So the first step is always the self-check. While you're in a warm bath or shower, you feel yourself and if there's any irregularities, you got to go see a doctor, but don't panic. Don't trust Google on everything. Google says that everything is cancer, okay? If you have any lumps or bumps on you, it could be uh, it could be pimples, cysts. It could be hydrocele, which is a buildup of fluid, uh, which is curable by doing nothing or by diet or by oral medication. It could be sperm seal, which is a buildup of sperm, and that's curable by, I think, the same things. It could be the spermatic cord and so on, but um, in rare cases it could also be cancer, and that's why you have to go see the doctor, because it's just better safe than sorry. In my situation, what happened was just all in one day, my left nut became three or four times normal size. It was hardened, and it was not sensitive. I could squeeze on it, and it wouldn't hurt, which is irregular. Now, if you hurt at all, that's a good sign that there's an infection, and maybe not cancer. But if you are numb to it, or if it's just not sensitive as you would imagine it would be, that's a pretty bad sign that it is most definitely a tumor. And I'm pretty sure that the doctors are going to say this is something that needs to be removed. Not all tumors are cancerous, but they never know until they remove it. So, so it takes most guys an average of five months before they finally bite the bullet and go and see the doctor. And I don't blame them. They don't want doctors or anybody really fiddling around with the balls. But if you have a potentially fatal disease inside of you, that's the difference between having a small surgery and a, and a short recovery versus having a lot of chemotherapy if you catch it early enough, like 45 to 60 doses of chemo. The average age range that testicular cancer hits guys in is 15 years old to 35 years old. I've heard another source say 18 to 40 years old. And that doesn't mean that if you're young or older that it can't get you too. But also, uh, white guys are primary targets for testicular cancer. Once again, doesn't mean that if you're black, Asian, Hispanic, Arabic, whatever, that you can't also get it too. Just for some reason, white guys are the primary target. So. Uh, next step is to go and see the doctor. What doctor? Do you want to see your family doctor who will probably see you faster? Or do you want to see the urologist who is a specialist in this area? Actually, a urologist is a specialist in the whole urinary tract. So it's like the testicles, the prostate, even ovaries. So women are going to be there too. And I chose the urologist, but the urologist told me that there was like a three week wait time. And at that point in time, I had already had I had already had this uh, going on with me for about three weeks. Um, and I told them, uh, I said, you know, I told them my symptoms. I said, I think it might be an emergency with me. It's an enlarged and hardened testicle. And they said, well, wait a second, let me try to work you in a little earlier. And they got me in like within the week, by the end of that week. I called them on a Monday and they got me in on a Friday. So uh, it's like a $150 fee if you do not have insurance just to go and see the urologist. You're going to walk in through the doors. You'll see men and women there. You're going to go into one room and they're going to have you do a urinalysis where you pee in a cup and they're going to, I guess, do tests on your urine, take your temperature, take your weight, take your blood pressure, and then you go in and you'll see the doctor. So when the doctor came in, uh, he put on his gloves, said, drop your pants, felt on both testicles just to compare them both. It took about 10 seconds or so. He said, uh, do, do you feel any sensitivity? Does it hurt? And he said, uh, yeah, this is something that we usually remove. I said, how sure are you? He said, about 100%. And man, that freaked me out. Now, in your case, uh, if you have nothing, the doctor will probably just feel on you and go, that's nothing, don't worry about it. Or I think this is something else and here's some medicine, okay? More than likely what's gonna happen is they're going to send you out to do an ultrasound because if they feel something, they wanna make sure what's inside of you is a liquid and not a solid. If it's a solid, that means it's a tumor, that means it has to be removed. You cannot just remove part of the ball, you cannot just remove the part that's on the ball, you'd have to remove the whole ball itself. Um, but anyway, yeah, the ultrasound is the next step. So your doctor is probably going to be the one that schedules the scrotal ultrasound for you. If you're insured, they're gonna send you to the nearest, quickest place, not necessarily the cheapest place. Who cares if it costs 700 to $1,000 because it's insured, that's the insurance paying for it. If you're uninsured, they're probably gonna send you to a different kind of place, pull some strings for you. I know that there's a place in my area that's ran by students. It's like an institute, 
of ultrasound and they cost something between 50 bucks to $100 for the, for the ultrasound. Uh, when you walk into the ultrasound place, I can tell you that I've never seen I've never seen a male ultrasound operator before. It's just like uh, it's just like a pregnancy ultrasound where they use a stick gun and they put it on top of the place that they're trying to do the ultrasound on. So uh, in my case, I walked into a room. It's a dark room. Uh, the girl told me to uh, they were going to leave the room. They gave me a couple towels and a blanket, and they said, "You're going to take off your pants. You're going to put your entire penis on one towel." hold the shaft with another towel to where the only thing that's sticking out is your balls and then you're going to cover up your legs with the blanket. So the whole thing took about 30 minutes, maybe even 40 minutes even, and they did use gel. Uh, they had to readjust me every now and then. And they told me that they were going to give me a CD to take it back to my urologist. And they could not tell me if it was solid or liquid even though they could look and they could tell if it was solid or liquid at the time. So they gave me a CD and I went back and I started doing research and I'm going to put a link in the description of this video on how to read testicular ultrasounds so that you can tell if you have a solid or if you have a liquid or if your nuts are completely fine. When your doctor receives the ultrasound report pictures, they're going to be able to look at them and tell if it is a solid or a liquid that's inside of you. If it's a liquid, good news, all you got to do maybe at most is take oral medication maybe change your diet, maybe do nothing. It might be something that you even have to live with. If it's that your testicle's too damaged and they find that out on the ultrasound, they're gonna want to remove that. If they find out that there's a solid inside of you, that means it's a tumor and they're gonna want to remove that as well. Now there's different kinds of tumors. There's a benign tumor, which is non-cancerous, it doesn't spread. And there's a malignant tumor, which is cancerous and it does spread. And there's different kinds of cancers that move at different kinds of speeds Nobody knows what kind of cancer you have and what kind of speed it's going, so they're, they're going to assume that it's the fastest moving, most aggressive cancer, and they're going to want to get it out of you the very next day, or probably within that week. But with my, with my case, it was the very next day. Um, now, with other cancers, what they would normally do at this point is they would have a biopsy, which is a skin sample, just to see if that area is cancerous and to tell what kind of cancer it is that's inside of you. But they can't really do that with a testicle. It would pop the ball like a balloon basically and if it is cancer that's inside it would just spread everywhere so very anti-productive. Uh, something that my doctor did not talk to me about was a prosthetic testicle which is basically like a silicone implant. There's different sizes, I guess different prices and all that but you know even if he did ask me about it I would have declined. I would have rejected it because I've heard that there is a chance that it could become infected inside of you, then you have to do a surgery to get it all out of you again. So, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't want anything fake inside of me. At this time, the doctor might also talk to you about sperm banking, which is probably, I think, $250 per year to maintain a sperm sample. And I don't think that a sperm sample can go past maybe five years. It starts losing quality pretty, pretty quickly after that. Uh, it's not really something that you have to worry about at this moment. If, it, if by chance it goes as far as you doing chemotherapy or radiation, that is what is going to affect the, the quality of your sperm. You can still have children with one ball. Hey, how many, how many fists does it take to knock a guy out? Just one. How many balls does it take to knock a girl out? Just one. Well, things just got real now, and suddenly you're super depressed. And uh, actually with me, I was way depressed as soon as I did my own self-examination because I just knew that something was wrong. But what you need to understand is that you're actually kind of lucky to have this kind of cancer as opposed to another kind of cancer. It's got the highest cure rate of all cancers. Uh, Lance Armstrong even, he had it spread up uh, stage 3 all the way up into his brain. Did some chemo, walked away, he was fine, completely cured after that. Uh, it's, it's one of the most reactive to radiation and chemotherapy, which I know sucks, but you're not going to die from this. Uh, very, very slim chances of dying from something like this. It's possible to die from this, it's just very slim. Okay, so really this is just a bump in the, wor this is just a bump in the road. It's, it's not going to be a big deal. Life with one ball is completely unnoticeable. I mean, losing an eye, that's a big deal. Losing a finger, that's a big deal. Losing a fingertip, that's a big deal. Losing a nut, 
it's not a big deal, buddy. It's, you're going to you're gonna make it. And if this is the worst thing that ever happens to you in your life, you're going to be fine. You're going to be absolutely fine. The doctor is going to want you to do a blood test at least one day before the surgery uh, so that they can have different tumor markers for later on. And I'll talk more about that later. But the blood test is just one stick of the needle, one vial of blood. If you're uninsured, it's probably like $100 or $200. And uh, the orchiectomy, actually, the prices for that, if you're uninsured, is going to be all over the place as well. It could be between $5,000 or $8,000. Uh, the hospital bill itself is going to be $5,000. The anesthesia bill is going to be $800. Urologist bill of $1,500. Pathology bill of about $400. That's generally about around about the prices. But then again, if you're uninsured, you also need to ask every single one of them before paying for an uninsured discount. And a lot of the times they'll say, okay, and cut the bill in half or at least give you 20% off. So the very night before the orchiectomy surgery, you're going to want to fast starting at midnight. You can't eat anything. You cannot drink water. You can't smoke. You can't chew gum. Nothing goes in the mouth, not even, not even your toothbrush after that time. And I think the reason for that is because they don't want any puffiness of the skin, no water buildup in the skin that would interfere with the surgery. So I, would, I woke up the morning of and I hit the toilet, tried to get everything out of my system because you don't know when you're going to get to push hard like that again. And I gave myself a haircut because where they cut you is right on the groin and it's like maybe an inch below my stomach right where the pubes are. And you can either shave yourself or you can wait until you're unconscious and then the doctor shaves you. It's completely up to you. <laughs> so. I got to the hospital, I was supposed to be an outpatient, which means I go in, I do the surgery, and I get out of there. The surgery is supposed to be like a 30 minute long surgery. I got there at 11.30 for a 1.30 surgery, and much like an airport and an airplane, if your plane is delayed, you just have to wait and wait. So I waited for like two hours until about 3.30. What they did was they put me in a bed and I got to watch TV, and uh, they put an IV in my forearm. They didn't want to put it in the veins here because this is the crease of my arm. They wanted to put it here where I'm not going to have any uh, movement or interference with the needle. So they first gave me a numbing shot and then they gave me an IV and they taped it, taped it down. If you got a hairy arm, then you're probably not gonna like the tape on there. And that's the worst part right there is the IV and they just dripped liquid fluid into me. Now the whole time I was wearing loose uh, loose and light clothing, they're going to put you in one of those gowns anyway, so that part's not really going to matter until after the surgery. You're not going to want pants that are super tight on you. Uh, so prepare for like a marathon in a way, uh, in the morning all the way up until the actual surgery. You're just going to lie in bed and you're just going to wait. And the fluid drops and when the, when the anesthesiologist comes in and he finally puts the he finally puts the medicine inside of you. It's not going to be but about 10 to 20 seconds and you'll be completely out. Now I talked to my doctor beforehand and I said, I'm very scared that the anesthesia, that the anesthesia is not going to put me to sleep. I saw a movie and he said, don't worry, we're going to be monitoring your brain waves and your heart waves and if something's irregular, if we see any movement on there, we're going to know that you're not unconscious and that you need more of that. So. Um, I woke up and I felt fine and I think the difference between feeling fine and not depends on how much drugs you get. I've heard people say that they woke up and they were in a whole lot of pain. I wasn't in any pain, really. I was even up and walking to the car, sitting down and I had somebody drive me back home. Now you can't drive yourself back home. You're not supposed to drive and you're not supposed to sign legal documents yourself uh, at, until like 24 hours after the surgery because even if you sign legal documents, they can always go back on it and say, you were under the influence of drugs and therefore you weren't actually in your right mind to sign these legal documents. So now onto the recovery portion, which is going to be a little personal, so if that makes you uncomfortable, this is your heads up. The incision is about two and a half inches long. It was sealed with glue, not with stitches, and I kind of like that. It healed up very well. I don't have any stitch bumps on me. For the first week, you're not supposed to lift more than 10 pounds, and you're not supposed to work out until four weeks after. Furious Pete from YouTube said six weeks after in his case. So every day is an improvement upon itself. On day number one and two, you need to be lying down a whole lot. Anytime I sat up or stood up for a long period of time, say to go to the bathroom, the longer I stood, the more blood would just rush to the area of operation, all the way from the incision, all the way down to the bottom of my nutsack. And it was like a huge swelling and it made me nauseous. As soon as I laid down flat, 
that would go away. So once again, you need to be laying down, you need to be healing, resting, and having somebody else help you out around the house. Uh, that kind of changes closer to around day number three and four. I got up and started walking around. At that time, you're going to want a jock strap, something that pushes, uh, pushes you and lifts you up, and it kind of prevents the swelling from going all in that one area. It hurts to laugh, it hurts to cough, it hurts to uh, sneeze, it hurts to push real hard. You're not going to want to get on the toilet and push real hard. They're going to give you laxatives for that, but I think with me, it took me even three days for it to even start working with that. They have anti-pain pills. I never took more than just one pain pill per six hours. The guys on YouTube that you see up and walking around a day after their surgery, they are very well drugged up. I was not, and I decided that I needed to just lie down and heal, because why, you know, you might have stuff to do, but you're going to have a lot more problems if you don't heal up real fast. By number, day number four and five, I was feeling close to normal walking around the block, and by day seven, it was pretty much to where I could walk very long distances or sit for a very long time with the jock strap once again. Uh, I just couldn't do anything very fast. Okay, so testosterone. You're supposed to be able to get testosterone tests with a blood test. I don't know how much it costs. If you're low on testosterone, your urologist can give you a testosterone prescription. You can take that, but basically what's supposed to happen is your other ball is supposed to make up for the lack of the one ball, and it's supposed to even you out. So you're not supposed to have any problems with that uh, there. So what does it look like and what does it feel like? Well, the answer to that always changes over time. In the very beginning, what it looks like, it for the first two weeks, it's sore. That's what it feels like. For the first two weeks, the way that it looks is I thought that the doctor had given me a prosthetic testicle because there was an area of fluff or padding or something like that that was inside and then after two weeks it became like loose skin. After two more weeks by week four it came a little bit tighter up to the muscle. So now what it looks like is uh, it actually looks quite normal. It looks rounded off just looking at myself you cannot tell that I've had a removal surgery. Um, only in a warm shower, I would say, does it look like anything. Uh, the, the one ball that I do have hangs towards the center. And even then, I've looked both sides, and you can't really tell. Not unless you come and you give it like a hand exam or something. So the first four weeks, also, there was like patches of bruising all over. Left, right, top, bottom, penis, uh, you know, nutsack, everything. Um, and... It was a little bit painful to uh, to move around and to handle for the first couple weeks. After two weeks, I'd say it was a little bit more mm, bearable, and uh, I was I was in the mode to get back into getting to business. So you can get an erection after. Well, I mean, I guess you can at any time, but it's going to hurt the first two weeks. Um, an erection feels a little bit a little bit uh, funny for the first month, I'd say, because you can feel that there's something missing on the side of the removal. Um, orgasms feel exactly the same. Uh, not as much comes out. I'd say maybe 70% comes out. Um, and I would say uh, probably not as not with as much force or as much pressure uh, because there's not as much come. The incision scar that I have feels numb and also underneath it for about one inch also has kind of a numb feeling as well. That might go away over time, I'm just not sure. Immediately after the surgery, your urologist sends your nut that he just dissected from you off to a pathologist who measures the tumor and takes samples of it to see what kind of cancer it is. Then they cut it up into little pieces and send it off to become dog food. Next time you see your urologist, they're going to give you the pathology report, and it's going to say that you have either seminoma or non-seminoma. Now, seminoma is the less aggressive cancer, and it's typically in the older age range of guys. Non-seminoma is the more aggressive cancer, and it's typically in the younger age range of guys. There's four different kinds of non-seminoma. The only reason why any of that's important is so that they can know what kind of chemotherapy to use on you because they all respond to different chemos different. So, after I got... After I got my, uh, my result back, mine was seminoma, by the way, uh, pure seminoma, and oh, apparently if you get to it fast enough, the orchiectomy alone cures something like 85% of guys with seminoma. I think it cures something like 70% with the non-seminoma. 
So I started asking myself, what did I do? Did I eat something? Did I drink something? And the only known risk factors that doctors know today is if you have the history of an undescended testicle, or if you have a family member like a brother or a father that has it, then you are 15 times more likely to get it later. And that's all that they know today. Maybe later they're going to find something else out. In my case, it may very well have been genetic because my first cousin, when he was in his mid-20s, he ended up getting testicular cancer too. So there's three stages of testicular cancer. The pathology report confirms that you have at least stage one, which is confined to the testicle. It could have gone to stage two, which spreads to the lower ab, or stage three, which spreads to the chest and above, even to the brain like Lance Armstrong. And the only way that they can find out exactly what stage that you are in after this is through additional scans like CT scan, MRI scan, and X-ray scan. Uh, and blood test which measures tumor markers. Now before you did the surgery, they did a blood test on you and they're gonna give it time before you have to redo another blood test if you had high levels because it takes time for the levels to fall. If you've cured your problem, the levels don't all fall back to whatever normal level is all at once. So the next blood test is also one stick of the needle. It is one vial of blood, $100 to $200 if you're uninsured and it tests three different things. It tests AFP level, HCG, and LDH. AFP's normal range is 0 to 10, and it represents, it represents liver damage. Uh, so if you have liver cancer, you'll have higher AFP levels. If you have stage 2 uh, testicular cancer, more than likely there's going to be a higher level as well. Half-life is 5 days. So, for example, let's say you had an AFP level of 100. You could go five days after the thing is cured and say that it's at 50. Five more days is at 25, just as an example. HCG is also found in pregnant women. In guys, normal level is like zero to three. Uh, the idea here is that the cancer is basically working as a leech, like a baby would be working as a leech inside of a woman. So cancer is working as a leech inside of your body and it's showing up on the radar. Um, the normal half-life is two to three days and mine in the beginning was nine when I did my test again two weeks later it fell down to a zero last is LDH it's a little bit different than the other two because the normal range is from 100 to 250 what it measures is tissue damage or tissue healing rather and the idea here if you have a high level of that is that the cancer is causing that tissue damage or your body is trying to repair the damage done by the cancer but you cannot say you can't half life it to zero because uh, you can have a deficiency in LDH it doesn't go below 100 so mine was at 3000 and so since I cannot half life it down to zero, I'd have to half-life it to the base of like say 250 or so and say 2800 uh, every three days I'm gonna say the half-life is uh, it cuts in half like that so three days later it'd be at 1400 plus the base uh, three more days later it'd be at 700 plus the base and and so on so um, I took mine at two weeks and it fell from 3,042 to 368, which is about one-tenth of what it was. But I went one more week afterwards, and they tested again, and it fell to 209. So it was apparently still falling, but the doctor kind of scared me. He was like, if it doesn't fall back to normal, then we have to treat you like you have stage 3, give you a lot of chemo. Um, scared me, so for a whole week I was quite depressed. Uh, but luckily it did fall. Now for the scans. You've got the x-ray and the CT scan. They're going to check your pelvis area and your chest just to make sure that your lymph nodes have not been enlarged by the cancer, which is called lymphoma. So the chest x-ray doesn't take any preparation whatsoever. You just show up. You pay the, the uh, self-pay fee of $75 if you're not insured. It is a picture of the front and a picture of the side. And it gives you a little bit of radiation, which is not healthy. The CT scan, however, needs a lot more radiation. Self-pay is probably $300 to $350, takes about five minutes to do in total. But the midnight beforehand, or the morning beforehand, you have to start fasting. Because an hour and a half before the scan, you have to drink about 24 ounces of lemonade-flavored iodine. Not real tasty, but the lemonade kind of masks the iodine flavor just a little bit. 
You wait an hour and a half, you drink eight more ounces of that same lemonade flavor iodine. Before they lay you down on the bed scanner, they hook you up with an IV. Second time I've been hooked up with an IV in my life, and it's all happening over and over again. Uh, lay you down, and then they pump you full of more contrast, which is iodine again. It lights you up, and then the scanner goes through you, and it takes x-rays of your body in segments. So it's a lot more radiation than, uh, than just one x-ray. So what are the risks of all this radiation? You can end up with lymphoma from the radiation. You can end up with bone cancer, leukemia from that much radiation. And you're gonna have to be doing these scans for quite a while um, since, since you had testicular cancer. They're gonna to want to do it every so, every so often, uh, months and then years and so on. So there's another option which is the MRI scan and that uses magnetism. Self-pay is about $600 depending on where you go to and I've heard that insurance doesn't cover it at all. Um, and it's supposed to last a lot longer. It's supposed to be maybe one hour, maybe half an hour, something like that. So depending on your test results that you get back, uh, this could lead you down a lot of different paths and I only have experience down one of these paths. So the rest of them I've done research on and this is the research that I found. Okay, worst case scenario is you have stage three very developed uh, testicular cancer, your lymph nodes are enlarged, and your blood work came back with tumor markers all over the place. Your urologist might suggest that you do another surgery called an XRT, where they cut your abs open, open you up, they take out the enlarged lymph nodes, and close you back up. This is the same thing that Tom Green did on the Tom Green special. In fact, it happened after his testicle removal surgery. Uh, not very educational, it's just going to gross you out. I don't suggest that you watch it at all. Okay. Next, the urologist is going to forward you onto an oncologist who is a cancer doctor who deals in radiation and chemotherapy. And then you choose what you want from there. Do you want uh, radiation, which is going to, it's going to be like a big gun over you, zapping you in one area and the side effect is going to be mostly just that you get tired and lazy throughout the day or do you want chemotherapy which is where you get you get stuck every single day and get poisoned through your veins um, in my own opinion I think that you have a better chance of survival with chemotherapy and I think that when it comes to something like stage 3 developed cancer I think that's the only option that they do have if they found one place on you that's an enlarged lymph node, they might aim the radiator gun at that place. Otherwise, the question that you will always have is, is there something floating around inside of me that didn't show up on the radar that can't be hit any other way except for that I bomb my whole body with chemotherapy? Okay. I don't know the prices for radiation. I do know the price for chemotherapy because at one time we didn't know if I had stage 3 or if I had stage 1. Turns out I just had stage 1. So with stage 1 you have the optional uh, one dose of chemotherapy or one, do or one uh, method, one deal of radiation. Uh, otherwise if you have stage 2 or higher then you're going to have to be doing uh, three or four rounds of chemotherapy, three or four cycles of chemotherapy and one round or one cycle is 15 doses Monday through Friday for three weeks okay so one dose what is the cost of one dose it's it actually depends on your body weight uh, so I'm 175 pounds I asked the doctor if I were to pay by cash for some reason just for research purposes how much would that cost and he said something like 200 bucks but there's also grant money that's out there and available um, the side effects of chemotherapy and by the way the side effects can be felt all in one dose. It's just all up in the air, everybody feels something differently. But the side effects of chemotherapy are hair loss, stomach problems, metallic taste, loss of appetite, you can feel tightness of the throat. Um, I've heard a lot about collapsed veins. You get stuck so many times in your arm and it's filled, you know, since it's basically poison, BEP and EP, um, going inside of you. It might make the veins kind of shrink up, shrivel up a little bit. They can, they will spring back after time. But uh, another one is something like dark spots, I heard. Another big possible side effect to chemo and radiation is infertility. It could last for two years after your treatment, or it could last even longer than that. Who knows? So that's why they talk to you about sperm banking, 
which stores a sample of sperm for like, I think 250 bucks per year, depends on which bank you go to. And uh, the quality is supposed to start going down, I think, after five years or so of it. Now, I didn't decide to do that because I've got a boy and a girl, so I'm already set. And then there's another thing called active surveillance. Active surveillance is if you decide to do nothing, and that's if you have stage one anything. Okay, It's safer to do active surveillance if you're stage one seminoma rather than stage one non-seminoma because if you have stage one seminoma, all your tests are clear. 85% chance you've been completely cured just by the removal surgery, but there's a 15% chance that there's something still floating around inside of you. If you have non-seminoma stage one and all your tests are clear, it's basically a 70% chance that you were completely cured and a 30% chance that there's still something inside of you, which is why they give you the option of doing a one dose. And what the doctors all have been saying is if you're the kind of guy that follows up on it and you're on the ball, then they're more comfortable with you doing the active surveillance rather than if you're a young guy that wants to get on with your life and doesn't want to doesn't want to do any uh, any more therapy even if you might need it in the future they feel more comfortable giving that guy the one dose here's an example of a surveillance schedule your surveillance schedule depends on what stage of cancer you had and what kind of cancer you had um, so let's start with seminoma stage one, confined to the testicle, blood work came back fine, uh, the scans were all clean. For year number one, every three to six months you're going to do a blood test. And then a CT or MRI scan and an x-ray is going to happen on month three, month six, and month 12. This is the schedule that you use if you do not want any treatment at all. But let's say you do want one dose of chemo or radiation. That's what this schedule is for. It's slightly different than the one above it. Uh, you can see it's slightly more lenient. Doctors really want to treat the younger guys who they feel are not going to be following up as much uh, as, the, as the older guys who they know is going to be following up. Seminoma stage two is they found some irregularities in your scan for the abdomen or the uh, pelvis area and they're going to make you do chemotherapy. So this is the schedule that you'd follow for that. So minimum stage three is there were some irregularities in your blood work after the surgery, or they found some enlarged lymph nodes. Then they made you do chemotherapy, and after the chemo, this is the surveillance schedule that you would be on after that. non seminoma is a little bit different. Uh, there's a stage 1A and 1B. 1A means it was inside your testicle. 1B means it was outside of the testicle. So like... Uh, a lump or a bump or something on the outside. So that's why urologists can feel it and they can pretty much guess this is non-seminoma right here, which is a little more aggressive than seminoma. Um, so whether you have 1A or 1B and you decide to do nothing, these are your schedules here, but let's say you had 1A or 1B and you decided to treat it uh, with one cycle of BEP chemotherapy. This would be the schedule for that. Now I'm not for sure if it should say one cycle or one dose because one cycle or one round would be like 15 doses, Monday through Friday for three weeks. So if you have stage two or three, from then on, you're pretty much gonna have to do something about it. You're either gonna do chemotherapy or you're gonna do XRT, lymph node removal surgery. So here's the schedule. If you do, first you do the chemotherapy and then you do an XRT surgery for lymph node removal. Okay, next, if you do XRT first, and then you do chemo afterwards. This is the schedule for you. And finally, if you do the XRT lymph node removal and no chemotherapy, you have a completely different schedule here. Well, that's all for the video. Uh, I'm sure there's stuff that I missed. If you have any questions, please just leave them in the comment section below. Um, I wanna support whoever I can. And this is the kind of stuff that I wish that I had known before everything hit the fan. So. Guys, please like, uh, share, subscribe. I really appreciate it. I hope this helps somebody out.